Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to a brand new episode of Escape to the Quarter Bend. As always, I'm your host, Adrian Johnson. And on this episode, I went to the Quarter Bends, you know, as I am wont to do. And uh, I found a chunk of issues that, you know, I hadn't read in a very long time. And you know how just sometimes you get an urge of, you know, it may be a book or, or a little series or just something to where you've read it before. And you might have either purged it from your collection, uh, given it away, or let someone borrow it and they never returned it, or just something to where, hey, you know, I, I haven't read this for a long time. Um, let me let me let me pick these up. They're all in sequence. You know, it's a big chunk. They're only a quarter, you know, a quarter a piece. So let, let me let me go. Let me go ahead and just pick them up and see what's going on. And that series is Jim Lee's. Wildcats. Now I picked up all of these issues. I believe it is um, issue issues one through, I believe about uh, sixteen or okay, about okay eighteen. That's what it is. Um, I did have number sixteen in here, um, but I think I may have misplaced it. You know when I brought them home or whatnot. Uh, and then fourteen. You notice there's a gap between thirteen and fourteen. Uh, 13 and 15 rather, uh, 14 is actually was a part of that Image X month where all the um, image creators, uh, all the image founders, they traded books and Eric Larson ended up doing uh, issue number 14 of Wildcats, which I disown. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it just didn't, it, it didn't look right. And it was just like, I think even, I think even um, Larson himself was just like, eh, not, not my, not my best, <laughs> Not my best moment. And um, Jim Lee took on Savage Dragon for that month. But that Savage Dragon was not drawn by Jim Lee for the most part. It was actually drawn by Richard Bennett. And again, not the finest moment. And in fact, Larson ended up going back and redrawing that issue of Savage Dragon so that it fit in with the continuity, you know, that he was currently, you know, building with that story to that point. Um, Lee did not do the same for Wildcats number 14. However, that's neither here nor there. What I wanted to focus on is the actual, um, I'd say this is about, this represents about the first, the first two or three years of uh, Wildcats, you know, and I was a Wildstorm kid, okay? I'm a Homage Studios Wildstorm kid. Um, so when Jim Lee you know, announced that he was doing, you know, um, his own image book. I hadn't quite come to the hobby yet. I would come into the hobby about 93, you know, but I caught up very quickly, you know, because I loved Jim Lee on his X-Men work. You know, one of the first um, X-Men books that I picked up, you know, once I got into the hobby was, you know, that ubiquitous uh, X-Men number one that you can, that you could just find in quarter bins back then, even then. You know what I'm saying? Because there's 8 million of them floating around, of course. You know, so I, you know, picked up one. Obviously loved it. And, you know, being X-Men and, you know, X-Men was popular on Saturday morning cartoons at that time. You know, I gravitated towards that, you know. And so when I found out that he was doing, or he had a book rather, called Wildcats that he was doing, you know, through Image once I you know, got up to speed with the image stuff. I was like, oh man, this is, this is my jam right here. You know, because to me, uh, Jim Lee really represented like the gold standard, if you will. And I think a lot of people in the industry, um, at that point also considered the same, you know, because his, um, his work just had that real commercial sheen to it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the musculature was there, you know, cool looking characters for the time. <laughs> And, and 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 of course, and of course, you cannot discount the 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 inking of Scott Williams as well, you know, which was a vital ingredient to carrying over this vision of Jim Lee's, you know what I'm saying, on the artistic tip. And the, the coloring, the, the burgeoning coloring, you know, of Joe Chido and uh, the colorist, um, soon to be computer colorist um, at uh, Wildstorm Colors as well. And... I think also another point that's glossed over is the fact that Wildcast was actually co-created by Brandon Choi, 
who was a childhood friend of Jim Lee's. Um, from what I know of, you know, what I've read about him, there's very little, there's precious little out there, you know, past like, you know, the formation of image, you know, as far as like pictures or what he does. But I think I had read that he was an attorney. Um, but once, you know, image uh, became a thing and really had this meteoric success early on, uh, he had actually gotten enough, you know, money to where, hey, you know, he was able to, I believe, and somebody correct me if this is wrong, um, he was able to leave his law practice for a little bit and just write books for uh, Wildstorm, you know, to kind of f uh, formulate the uh, universe. Uh, but he ended up practicing and training to be a Navy SEAL, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. I, I, I'm i pretty sure I read that. I'm, I'm not making that up. Um, so Brandon Choi, actually, as mysterious as he is, you know, he really did, you know, enjoy like this mili militaristic type stuff. You know what I'm saying? Who does not get enough credit. You know, he doesn't get enough play in um, his formation, you know, his uh, in terms of his uh, contributions in the formation of the uh, Wildstorm universe, as it were. Um, and I believe um, in one of these issues, uh, he implants like some Navy SEAL stuff too with like John Lynch and you know, the um, secret organization, like the CIA analog called um, IO, which is International Operations. So anyway, that's enough with uh, issue one. Let me get to the rest of these issues. Now, with issue two, you got like this holographic cover. And you know what? <laughs> I love this stuff. Are you kidding me? I love this stuff. There's a time where I fell out of love with it, but you know, it, it's, it, it was mesmerizing, it, mesmerizing to me, you know, as a kid, you know, and, uh, and now as, as, uh, as kitschy as this stuff is, I still love it. I still, I still get a kick out of it. You know, foil covers in general and like little cover enhancements, they're starting to make a comeback, you know, in recent days. So, you know, um, perhaps it never went out of style and people just want that again. But yeah, and this is what I was talking about with, um, international operations, uh, Choi, puts in John Lynch, um, who is the head of this CIA analog, you know, in the Wildstorm universe, you know, and uh, everyone calls him Skipper because that's what they call like uh, leaders of teams um, in the Navy SEALs. So you can see even here, you know, uh, Choi is putting in, you know, that type of stuff, you know what I'm saying? And again, the art is, the art is great. The art, the art is great. I mean, Jim Lee is really giving it his all. There's a sideways page turn, you know, that we all love from the 90s. But yeah, I mean, just, just dynamic, just really cool stuff. I mean, I can't, I can't front on it. Ah, I forgot this was in here. Dan Quayle. Dan Quayle, if, uh, unless you're old enough or unless you came of age in the 90s like I did, you know, today you have no idea who Dan Quayle is. But believe it or not... This guy was the um, this guy was the uh, was the vice president uh, under George Bush, the first Bush, you know, back in 88, 88 through like 92. So he was there for eight years and <laughs> he kind of came off as like a, like a um, I don't know what you'd call it. Just like not quite an idiot, but kind of ineffectual. You know what I'm saying? And he had this uh, this. Um, Phrase that he would say, oh, I want to return to family values, family values, you know what I'm saying? And uh, that was his catchphrase, and they kind of um, parody it here. But the neat thing about issue two is that inside of here, it's actually at the end, you know, aside from an appearance by Youngblood at the end of this story, the true surprise is a uh, first appearance of Wills Portacio's Wet Works. And this is, like I said, it's the first appearance, you know, of uh, Wet Works. And it was due to come out shortly, shortly after, shortly after uh, this, uh, this issue. But unfortunately, um, Portacio had to go home to the Philippines because his um, 
younger sister uh, was, um, I believe she had contracted uh, lupus and um, she ended up passing away. So obviously he had uh, familial familial uh, obligations, you know, to go back home and, you know, really um, tend, um, tend to matters, you know, in the wake of that, you know, so while wet works became um, delayed by about a couple of years. I think it finally came out in 94. But this here is the first appearance of uh, wet works. And then you got issue three. I'll tell you what though, always love the um, splash page at the end of uh, issue three. This is, this, this always was so cool to me. You know what I'm saying? I almost puts you in the mind of like a more, a more, uh, graphic feel of like a uh of like a um a Walt Simonson or something but you know yeah this stuff right here this is this is this is so awesome all right and then number four number four this is the ending and that's a great splash page too you know Hellspot was such a cool looking uh villain you know I wish they had done a little bit more with them you know I think past like that first story arc you know, they just, almost like they, they just dropped them, you know? And you find that with a lot of the um, history of Wildcats. There's no consistent villain. I mean, you have, like, you know, the um, the alien, um, the enemy aliens that they fight, you know, the, uh, the Daemonites. But beyond that, there's no consistency. You know, there's a semblance of continuity, but not much. And you really didn't get that until... Um, Alan Moore takes over the title um, uh, way in the future, like past <laughs> past uh, issue, you know, 18 here. He takes over about issue 19 or 20, I believe, you know, and that, that's the one thing that kind of bothered me as well. You know, reading back to Wildcats, it's like the stuff looked cool, but there's no continuity to hang your hat on. So, again, Lee's artwork here is fantastic it's still great you know he really eats up this um this hell spot stuff you know like this stuff is this fantastic it's awesome um spartan is a cyborg in case i didn't mention that earlier and don't forget you know terminator 2 had just come out about this time terminator 2 is just maybe a couple years old so with Spartan being dismembered like this, you know, there's definitely shades of like, you know, Arnold and uh, T2, you know, especially at the end with the factory. You can see that, you know, here. That's a great Wolverine shot, of course. All you got to do is just <laughs> put the wing tips, you know, out of the side and put the adamantium claws coming out. That's, that's Wolverine. And that, that's a callback to what I was saying that, Lee knew what he was doing in terms of sticking with what was his bread and butter. You know, those teen books and Wolverine. And again, he, you can tell he loves drawing, you know, a uh, Hellspont. Like the, these shots, these close-ups of um, Hellspont, they're great. They're great. Just an awesome looking villain. Awesome, man. And I believe it's after issue four is where um, Lee ends up taking a sabbatical. Um... Live, Rob Liefeld did the same thing. It was almost like after the launch of Image was so, you know, meteoric and everything, uh, and everything happened so fast that he just had to take a break from it. And so there's a break that they take for like months, you know, like several months where they kind of fall back. Um, but also at the end of this issue, uh, you find that, you know, Lee really had no problems with using, you know, his book you know, as did a couple of the other um, image founders. They would use their books to debut other um, creators who were coming into the fold um, with their own books for image. And thus you have this. This is a tribe. This is a preview of a tribe by Todd Johnson and uh, Larry Stroman, the artist, Larry Stroman. And it was due to come out, you know, later, later that particular year. I believe this is still dated 90, 93. And man, this is this is um, excellent stuff, you know, by uh, Larry Stroman. Larry Stroman, who is um, influenced definitely by um, Howard Shaken, and I believe Larry Stroman was an assistant for Howard Shaken. So that would account for kind of the uh, stylishness that you see in like the uh, clothing and the kind of um, 
the kind of uh, blockiness of the uh, figures, you know. But just stylish stuff. Always, always liked uh, Larry Strowman for sure. You see that on display here as well. All right, so we skip to a couple months in the future now, and uh, Jim Lee is coming back off his uh, sabbatical. The first issues of Wildcats, those first four issues, were really supposed to be just its own miniseries. And he says here in this foreword that he wanted to extend the miniseries into, into a regular series. And when he comes back, he comes back with a bang. You could already tell just based on the artwork, okay, he's coming back firing on all cylinders. And not only that, he comes back with a gatefold. Not only a gatefold, but a quadruple. <laughs> a quadruple gatefold splash. Comes across one, two, three, four pages, you know? That's, man, that's crazy. Now, the thing about this splash is, is that um, years ago, I had done a, um, a podcast interview with uh, renowned colorist uh, Brian Haberlin uh, for the Sidebar podcast. And on that podcast, um, as he was, as I was asking him about, you know, the early days of Image, um, both Homage Studios, um, they shared uh, studios and facilities with uh, Mark Silvestri, who hadn't found it top cow yet, but Haberlin was clearly going to be his colorist, you know, Mark Silvestri's. Uh, but he was working with, you know, the colorist over there, uh, i.e. mainly Joe Chido and uh, Will Spatasio, while they were at Homage Studios, to kind of get a sense of like, okay, how is this computer coloring thing going to go? You know, let, 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 let's get the basics here, you know. But while Haberlin was there, he mentioned that he saw uh, Scott Williams working on these spreads, you know, and they were taped together. And he said that he was seeing, you know, Scott Williams could just throw the lines across, you know, these, um, these spreads. As they were taped together, you could just take a nib and just, and he asked him, he asked Williams, wow, how are you able to work on something that big? And, you know, do you have any, any, any fear, you know, about throwing these lines across the pages like that? And Williams simply replied, if I'm not mistaken, he said that Scott Williams just said, no, you just think of it as easy. That's all. You just think of it as easy. You're just, it's still inking and you're just throwing the lines down. You know, nothing's changed. Yes, the page is big, but you're just throwing the lines down. And, and so thus, you see Scott Williams really making, you know, Jim Lee come back with a bang, you know, with this, uh, with these gatefold spreads, man, you know. And the rest of the issue is, you know, it's good. You know, I believe this is a lead into a storyline called Killer Instinct, you know. But to me, this is kind of where... Ah, and this is supposed to be another character that never came out, um, but Jim Lee, created by Jim Lee, um, was supposed to come out. You know, I think this is more for copyright, <laughs> copyright purposes. Killer Instinct. This is supposed to be the next big crossover um, between um, Omaha Studios. Was well, the first ever Omaha Studios crossover, but this was, you know, Jim Lee. And Mark Silvestri, since they still say, shared the same studio at the time, you know, they figured, hey, let's uh, let, let's do a crossover, you know. But even with this, you're starting to see like, yeah, the artwork is good, but this story is just all over the place, just all over the place. And the issue ends with another quadruple gatefold once again. And again, I believe this is what, you know, Haberlin was referring to as well. Is you see how long these figures are. And you can imagine Scott Williams just throwing the lines. You know what I'm saying? And that's just amazing to me. Um, Lee actually ended up doing, you know, gatefolds again, you know, in several other books. Um, he did one, I covered it on another episode of Escape 
um, I believe uh, in an earlier episode where I covered um, Superman Unchained, uh, number one, it actually did not just the gatefold, but it was almost like a poster size. It was like eight pages. You know, one side was four pages. Then another side was the other four pages, you know, just big. You know, Lee's always been good for, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> All right. So then what you have is, okay, Killer Instinct starts, and it's just, eh, it's, 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 it's a story. It's a story. You know, it's Jim Lee art and everything. But you have the rise of Travis Charest, okay? And it is clear in this issue here. This is the Wildcat special. And I believe it is cover dated November of 1993. And it is clear that Jim Lee is starting to uh, groom uh, Travis Charest to be the heir apparent to take over Wildcats. I mean, he didn't give anyone else, maybe outside of uh, Jay Lee, who did a miniseries called Wildcats Trilogy um, earlier in this year. Besides that, Nobody else is drawing like the regular Wildcats book. And with this special, you see that Sheree is being groomed to take over the book, you know. And you can already see here that Sheree, he has semblances of Jim Lee's style. But there's something else going on here that is just him, that is unique to him. You know what I'm saying? And you can just see it, especially in like his uh, faces, his close-ups and everything. There's a lot more um, shadows going on. And there's some other stuff going on instead of like the, the um, typical work that you're starting to see, you know, at, um, at Wildstorm. Like that's a great shot there. You know, stuff like in Deep Shadow, you really wouldn't see this, you know, in Wildstorm. Except for like, you know, maybe uh, Sheree. And probably Aaron Wiesenfeld, um, who was um, beginning to work on uh, Team 7 around this time. But yeah, like it's clear that this guy is going to, he, he's, he's being set up to be the guy to take on Wildcats. And you have like this pinup, which just really says like, hey, yeah, he's going to be the guy. He's he's the guy. <laughs> he's the guy. And just yes, like just the rest of the issue is just you can see him growing almost exponentially. Like with each page, he's getting comfortable. His posing is getting better and better. He's able to handle the, the group shots. Uh, the faces are really good. Just oh man. Like, just really, really cool stuff. This right here, man, this Wildcat special is where you really start seeing Travis Charest starting to come into his own, the burgeoning talent that's there. And then Wildcats number seven, they're still continuing with, they're still continuing with this uh, Killer Instinct crossover. And again, it's, you know, the cover's, the cover's great. The cover's awesome. You know, but the story is like, eh, eh, eh. Meh, meh, it's all right, it's all right. But again, Travis with yet another pinup, you know? And again, it's definitely not like, you know, the um, homage studio style at that time. You can tell he has something else going on, especially with the hair. Oh, I always thought that Sheree did this as kind of like a self-portrait. You know, you can kind of sense this um, hair here, and it looks very similar to, you know, uh, Sheree's hair at the time, you know? Just little things here and there. You start to see, like, yeah, he's he's going to be the guy. Number eight. Okay, so Killer Instinct is finally over, but it's just like, eh, eh, eh. No story. Just, just, just stuff looks cool. Eh. And here's a, here's a, <laughs> here's a cameo by Jean Grey and. Um, Cyclops, you know, so it's like, eh, it's okay. But see here, Travis Charest has a backup story in number eight. And again, you see him getting better 
and better. Stuff looks totally. He's he's almost starting to veer away from like that typical, you know, Omar Studios look and do his own thing. Just do his own thing, and it's starting to become so apparent. Like, okay, he he's going to be the guy. Then at number nine, he has another backup with Warblade. And the thing that I noticed too about um, these tra these uh, Travis Charest stories. With him penciling, it takes a team of inkers, you know, to uh, get his um, pages out on time. You know what I'm saying? Like, every story has had, like, four or five inkers, you know, working on it, you know, at the same time. Perhaps because uh, Sheree's, uh, Sheree's pencils were so intensive that, man, they just had to have a team of inkers just really working on it to get it done. But it's beautiful stuff. I mean, it's just really, really gorgeous stuff. See, his faces are really starting to improve, and you can see the, um, it's not quite hatching. You know, there's some hatching in here, but the line work is starting to improve to such that, yeah, it's almost, it's, it's almost becoming an antithesis of what um, Lee had been doing. So again, he's he's becoming the guy. So they back off of Charade for a few issues. Um, these three issues here, um, 10, 11, and 12. No, actually, and 13. 10, 11, 12, and 13 um, mark the, reu the reunification of uh, Jim Lee and Chris Claremont. Um, obviously, the team that brought you, you know, um, the adjectiveless X-Men, the first three issues, you know, and plus, you know, Claremont having written um, the uncanny X-Men for over two, close to three decades prior to, no, 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 I'm sorry, for close to two decades prior to this, because he only took took it over in, I believe, 76, uh, I think, 75 or 76. And, uh, yeah, so, and I believe that, you know, Claremont and Lee, you know, um, left on somewhat acrimonious, you know, terms, you know, from the adjectiveless X-Men because Lee eventually took over more of the plotting duties and kind of showed, or rather, you know, the X offices showed Claremont the door. And he said, fine. And he left. But Claremont had a character called the Huntsman um, that he wanted to um, introduce. So I guess Lee putting out the uh, olive branch, said, okay, we'll bring them into our book. Bring them into our Wildcats. And it's like, okay. But the thing here, though, is here's here's my issue with, like, you know, the latter stage of, like, uh, Jim Lee. That's just egregious. I'm sorry. I love Jim Lee as much as the next guy, but that is just, when you look at it like this, it's like, no, come on, come on. Come on. It's not, uh -uh. You, you could tell that Lee was um, just trying to get the books out. But even that is like, come on, that's just egregious. That's terrible. I think more of the stars of this, um, of this period and going forward, it's kind of like the Wildstorm coloring team. Like the colors on here are fantastic. They, that, they really make up most of the book, you know. Just the coloring, but the actual, you know, art. While yes, it's exciting and good, it's just like eh, eh. The narrative stinks. The narrative sucks. So we'll skip past these. I mean, just eh, they're okay. Finally, we get to Travis Charest. Number fifteen is the first issue where Travis finally takes over the book, and you can just tell from the outset. Okay, we've groomed this guy to take over the book. We've given him backups. We gave him his own special. We've seen him working. Boom! You're going to take over our flagship book here at now, now titled Wild Storm Productions. And from the outset, look at this. You can tell it's something new and it's something different. Look at this face on Zealot. Look at all these faces. Look at this. 
Look at that. Look at that. Yeah. And the cool thing is, is that um, I had read that around this time, uh, J. Scott Campbell had mentioned that Sheree um, had actually gotten to the point to where he got his penciling to where he was going through like what <laughs> at the studio they kind of termed the his Mike McNola period, you know, where he was starting to do, you know, his pencils to such where it was more like, you know, a lot more shadows and everything, you know, and he was trying to just get the book out on time, you know, so that way it wouldn't have to take, you know, a team of anchors to get it done. And they called it his Mike McNola period because it's not as liney as his um, previous work, but, you know, it was much more simplistic in terms of, hey, just get the work done. But I love the cleanliness of it. You know, the faces are great. The faces are so individual. You know, he's getting the ethnicities and the shadows and dropping, spotting blacks. Like, it's just... Very cool stuff. And I can see why this would be a breath of fresh air to what had come before. You know what I'm saying? Oh, man. And look at this. He takes over the book, and already he has another pinup in here of Zealot. Gosh. You can just see, like, you can just see Travis is really emerging as, as a star here. And, and at this point, I mean, you have Travis Charay taking over your flagship book. You also have um, Aaron Wiesenfeld, who is kicking all sorts of ass, you know, with um, Team 7. You know, and J. Scott Campbell and uh, Alex Gardner coming up to speed on, you know, Gen 13. But, yeah, like, everything is in place. You know, for the next few years, Wildstorm is where it's at, you know. But, yeah, this, this uh, Charay work... That's a great expression right there. That's really cool. Like, Sheree just kind of takes over, you know? And it's like, oh, man, okay, this. <laughs> I know I said it before, yeah, but, yeah, he's the guy. This is the guy. Yeah. And then, as I mentioned, Aaron Riesefeld on Team 7. So, yeah, so I just want to close out with just now, Sheree is coming into his own. He's going to be on the book for the next um, the next year. But he starts running into, you know, deadline issues, you know. So they have to, like, split the book between him. Then they bring in other artists, like um, they have uh, Kevin Nolan and Dave Johnson, you know, coming in. Um, as well as other um, pencilers to kind of do, to kind of do a, um, a story that's split between Earth and the Wildcats go back to their home world of Kira. And uh, Sheree ends up illustrating um, that part of the story where they're off world and in space. And that is fantastic stuff. Those issues you rarely, for whatever reason, I rarely see in the quarter bins, you know, and perhaps for a good reason. You know what I'm saying? Because they're they're awesome. They're, they're very well illustrated, you know. But you can find those in a uh, paperback. Um, a Wildcats paperback called Homecoming, if I'm not mistaken. It has, um, it has uh, the Wildcats on the front of the uh, cover, and they're dressed like a, a Gap commercial. They all have, like, uh, T-shirts with their names on them, and they're wearing, like, khakis. I think that's, um, that's a uh, callback to a Gap commercial that was popular at the time, uh, a Gap advertisement, I think. Um, but inside, Alan Moore, yes, the famous or infamous you know, Alan Moore finally takes over uh, the book. And, uh, man, it's, it's a great story. And Alan Moore actually introduces for perhaps the one and only time some sense of continuity where it's it makes sense. The book kind of congeals. It makes sense, you know, and it's exciting. And then Travis is doing premier work that's starting to just blast them into the stratosphere. Um, although, uh, James Robinson, who writes, uh, Charade's, um, arc, he takes over with, uh, Charade with, uh, issue number 15. He writes on the book until, uh, Alan Moore gets there. So I, I, I don't want to give, um, James Robinson short shrift either. 
You know what I'm saying? But, uh, but yeah, basically from here on out, it's, it's charade. <laughs> it's a, it's a Travis charade party. And I think the book, you know, really blasts off from there as a uh, coda to this. Um, charade actually ended up coming back with, uh, several issues of, uh, Wildcats in the very late, the tail end of the nineties. Um, he had a number one issue that very much was a Bible to many of us, you know, back then. And he was aided and abetted by the great inking, the sharp inking of one Richard friend. And prior to that, what I really should say was the Bible was a, um, was a book called Wildcats X-Men, you know, where obviously it was a crossover with the X-Men drawn by Sheree, and he did, he did it all in gray tones, you know, he did, um, ink, uh, gray tones, and, uh, beautiful, beautiful, that one book there actually, um, influenced so many people in the industry that you saw other people trying to attempt, like, gray tones as well, you know, in their, in their book, and, you know, starting this very, um, thin, almost repetographic, re re uh, inking line, that you found in that book and in Travis's work going forward. So, you know, what began the decade, uh, earlier in the decade with Jim Lee, you know, founding, you know, Image and bringing out this book, you know, this team book ends with, you know, this artist really becoming um, the influencer of a new crop, a new generation of talent, you know, even if he, you know, doesn't believe so, as humble as he is. So I hope you enjoyed that kind of long episode of uh, Wildcats uh, from the quarter bins. And uh, just, yeah, I wanted, to, I, wanted, I wanted to get that out because I really like, I really like that period of artwork. But as I mentioned, when I read back over it, it was just like, ah, just, just, it just didn't hit, just didn't hit me like how it used to, you know, and sometimes books are like that. But what we did get out of it was the rise of a talented, a super talented, you know, artist that we saw grow within the pages of the book. And that's something you rarely see anymore. An actual talent who's able to just mature within the pages and then you see them, you see them blossom into like this fantastic artist or this fantastic creator that everyone knows and admires and loves. As always, I'm your host, Adrian Johnson, and thanks as always for watching and or listening to this episode of Escape to the Quarter Bins. Peace.